Morning, everyone. Um, happy to be here. I was here about a year ago at last year's conference, and I talked about some seeds that we were just starting to plant in, in Google's work with taking what we're good at with data and bringing it to the world of genomics. And the seeds have started to sprout, and that's this year's update. So when I listen to the talks I've already heard this morning and the work that I know many of you are doing, I think we are all engaged in a grand endeavor and that grand endeavor is to really build a library to help us understand human genomic variation and how it correlates to the impacts on our lives and our health. And that grand endeavor, I'm here to give an update on some of the parts of it that we're helping different groups work on and, and, and plant a bit, of a, a, a bit of a vision of how all these different projects, I see them starting to come together and I see opportunities for them to come together more quickly. So this is the goal. This is what we want. How do we get there? Well, if you want to really understand the genes of one person, which is the point, we intervene at n equals one, you need to study the genes of the many, and you can't do that by directly connecting donors and researchers one at a time. You need a whole set of mechanisms, including social processes in communities, like Sharon talked about, including technical bits, to pull together the information. And the challenges are all, how do we make this scale? We're not interested. We, we want to all have the problem Yaniv had, of not enough pixels to show our results. So how do we get there? Well, how do we make the data scale, the policy scale, the tools scale? And what I'm going to talk about is let's start with a branch. And in particular, I'm going to talk about three branches that are ongoing projects. I'm going to give a quick update on each of these and then talk about some of the commonalities and differences that are between these projects and see how it generalizes. I'm going to talk about some work that's, being, that's happening out of the VA, some work that the NIH, uh, NCI, is funding on cancer genomics, and some work that a nonprofit organization, Autism Speaks, is doing to understand the genetics of autism. And like I said, compare and contrast and see what can we learn from these branches, the ongoing projects, where can we build on the work that's already happening. So what does it take to build one of these branches, to create a branch of this tree of life, a, a, a piece of this grand library that we are all collectively helping to build? There's a lot of choices you have to make that are very specific to your purpose, to your goals. You have to decide what what is motivating you to pull together this community? Therefore, which subjects are you recruiting to be part of your study? What are the samples and, and data types on the molecular side that you want to organize? And what are the phenotypes that you want to organize? Eventually, I'd love to have us all have all the phenotypic information about all the studies, uh, individuals in all the studies. That's not how you start. You start by having a targeted focus and let's say, let's work on that. A set of infrastructure that is common and shareable. I'll talk more about that later. And then you have some, some process things to work through around once we've got the information, how do we make it useful to the researchers? How do we, how do we, uh, how do we attract the right cats, to borrow Sharon's metaphor? Once we have the, the food, who are the, the cats that we want to feed it to? All right. I have way too many slides. I apologize in advance if there's anything interesting in one of these slides that we'd, I don't have time to talk about. Come up and find me afterwards, or more, more important, talk to the people who, studies, who are leading these studies. Um, the, the Veterans Association has a million veterans program. They are working to understand how genes affect health, and they have run, obviously, one of the largest healthcare programs. They have a pilot they've been doing with the first several hundred genomes from this. The pilot is focused on methods and, and building scalable mechanisms so that as it scales up from hundreds to thousands to hundreds of thousands, it will be push button and, will, will, uh, and the branch will grow. These are some examples. There's a poster I have a pointer to here at this conference with more information. These are some examples of the kinds of QC studies they've been doing across their data. These are some examples of looking for correlations that might be artifacts of the, uh, the prep process, which, you know, at the scale of a dozen or two, you can look for these by hand. At the scale of 100,000 or two, you can't. So they need these kinds of studies to say, hey, is there more concordance with, uh, with which, sam which prep path we went down than there is with the actual data, uh, examples of looking for uh, uh, accidental duplicates in the samples. And the last one's interesting. You can see there are some labeled male samples who seem to have two X chromosomes. So, uh, and on this small sample set, that's almost certainly a mislabeling problem. So this, those are the sorts of analyses that they're doing in, in their branch, in their study. 
Moving on to a second branch, the National Cancer Institute funded a, uh, a project called the Cancer Genomics Cloud. And Institute for Systems Biology up in Seattle is one of the, the uh, awardees of this grant working with us at Google and with SRA. And the purpose of this is to take the TCGA data, Cancer Genome Atlas data, and make it as useful and available as possible using cloud technology to help get more analysis capability and have it be available to more people. So all the TCGA data joined with some public open access data. And then build a set of tools on top of it that are targeted at exploring the particular richness that comes with this particular data set. This is an example of a cohort explorer where you can pick a sub-cohort and then feed the data from that into IPython Notebook so you can use the tools that bioinformaticians are comfortable with to, in this case, look at uh, correlation of epidermal growth factor expression and mutation rates with, uh, by various tumor types. You can also, in, there, in, in, the, in the Cancer Genome Cloud, drill down. Here's an example of some of the methylation data. You can see that's a three billion row table. You can join it with another table and run, run various cross correlations, typically in seconds, to analyze the data. That's an example of the kind of tools. The outreach part of, of the Cancer Genome Cloud is how can we make this as useful to as many researchers as possible? And the intent is, once the data is fully curated and online, to provide credits to allow researchers not only to have access to data, not only to have access to this growing suite of tools, but to have access to the funding to actually use those tools and explore the data and really learn how can it be met. Uh, maximally valuable. These credits uh, ISB will be handing out starting next year. There's a, a link to, to learn more. Final of the three branches that I wanted to talk about is the missing project. So the Autism Speaks Foundation, autism has been known for many years to, have a, to be highly heritable. Uh, but the, uh, the understanding of the genetic architecture of autism is very weak at the moment. So what can we do to learn more about that? That's the purpose of the missing database. They are pulling together a database of 10,000 whole genome sequences from individuals from families with autism, together with pedigree information. These are mostly trios with some quads, and with deep phenotype information on the probands that's very narrowly targeted on the, the uh, symptoms and, uh, and particular variations of the individual's autism uh, symptoms, but it's very deep in that particular area. And uh, in addition to kind of some of the low-level capabilities that I showed on some of the other branches, they wanted to build something that was very easy and friendly to use for an autism researcher who had no interest in, in, in knowing how to use informatics tools. They wanted to speak the language of biology. So they put together a list of here are the kinds of questions that I'd like to make it easy from a portal and point and click for a, a biologist to say, I want to explore the data in my language. And then once they put that together, they designed an interface, a web interface to, to make this happen. And this interface is in the process of being built on top of the data that's already up there. Uh, and, and the data allows biologists to use those kinds of tools. The, Data that is going into the missing database, there's already been some very, very interesting early results from subsets of the data. The data behind this particular, uh, this particular study and more is online today. It's available. You can apply for access as, if, as an autism researcher at the link below, mss.ng slash researchers. And once you're given access, you have access to the growing data set. Um, which is up to about 1,000 samples now and, and, and many more in the pipeline, and the growing set of tools, low level and high level, on top of that. Okay, I said that was way too many slides to go into any detail, but I, I wanted to do that to really give a taste of by putting those three parallel and different studies side by side, we can see how this is part of moving towards that grand vision. We can see that while there are some very study-specific needs, and that's how each study is adding value in its own way, there's also a lot of common elements. So I'm going to take just a couple minutes and talk about those common elements. How do you build this in a way that allows you, as someone who wants to design another branch, to spend your time working on your science, on your population of interest, on your, your mission, and not have to spend your time worrying about reinventing the plumbing behind that's common across all of them? 
So some of the common elements. All three of these branches that I talked about are built on the Google Cloud Platform, which exposes all of the infrastructure that powers Google, Google Search, Google Mail, YouTube, et cetera, exposes that to the world, including a set of genomic-specific services that I talked about a little bit last year that my team is building to really take the, the Google Cloud Platform and make it usable uh, easily by people working with genomics. All three of these have built-in deep access control as a, a primary design principle to respect the, the uh, consents and constraints that are applied to their particular data. The, the details of the access control process are correctly different for each one. The mechanism is pretty much the same. The mechanism is the data is stored in the cloud platform. There's a, a single lock for each particular study that says, here are the people who can see it, and only these people can see it. And the organization that manages the data has the key to the lock. So if a researcher wants access to, to, to the Autism Speaks missing database, they ask Autism Speaks. Autism Speaks approves their, their, their application or not, and adds them to the list, and then they have access to all the tools. Everyone that should have access does, no one else does. And that same type of mechanism is a uh, applies to all the branches. Obviously, the details of who has the keys are different for each of the branches. The architecture in one slide, this is, a, I guess, architecture is the right word for this, is uh, if I were to sit, describe this in, in 15 seconds, take all the data, load it all to the cloud, index and analyze it to make it useful, and expose it via a variety of tools to a variety of end users. We've already shown some examples of some of the domain-specific high-level tools that are available to people like biologists who, who are interested in the, the data, not in the, the mechanisms. There's also available to all of these branches the lower-level tools that are friendly to bioinformaticians. This is just a screenshot of our studio. These, this this is, happens to be going over public data, but this is a reasonably interesting query run over the 1,000 Genomes data set that ran in 7.4 seconds and uses the power of R to visualize it. Those sorts of tools are available to all of the branches because they're all built on the same foundation. And you can drop all the way down if you have programmers on your staff and you want to build a fully bespoke set of analysis tools. There's a whole API. It's a Global Alliance for Genomics and Health standard API so that the, any tools built to speak to that, such as uh, IGV, the Broad's Genome Browser, and many others, uh, the data is available. There's a family of open source samples on GitHub. All right, so what have we just done? We've just done a very quick tour of three branches with links for more information, poster number 21 on the, uh, on the MVP pilot that uh, you can see more on here. And hopefully you get a sense of why I'm excited about the big vision, why I'm excited about how, how all these different branches, which are all coming together, all learning from each other, building on each other's expertise, are allowing us collectively to grow this tree of life. I want to thank all the, all the different people who contributed to each of these branches, but in particular, I want to thank all the individuals, the patients, the families, the veterans, who have donated their data because they too, in their way, believe in this grand vision, and they're the ones that are making it possible for us to work with the information and make it useful. Thank you.